Hello and welcome to my derivation of the source field metric. As an introduction, I will give the purposes of this video. I hope to show how to derive the source field metric from the Einstein field equation. I'll try to keep this as friendly to both the layperson as well as someone with a background in this mathematics as possible. If you do not have a background in this mathematics, I will show the equations and give a brief description of how they work. And I don't expect you to come out as an expert in this mathematics, but I do hope to satisfy curiosity. So to begin, we'll look at the different, we'll do a quick overview of differential geometry. And in the words of the book, John dies at the end, if you already know the dark secret behind the universe, feel free to skip ahead. So I'll use this common notation as a shorthand for derivatives throughout this video. For example, this uh, index of one means that you derive with respect to the first axis. This is a kind of like crappy notation because I've repeatedly used x, but it does show that the x1, x2, and x3 are the typical Cartesian coordinates. And we use these indices, these are indices, by the way, not exponents, because if you go to higher dimensions, you can easily run out of letters. Next is the covariant derivative. The covariant derivative is a derivative on curved space. So if you plug in a vector or tensor here, then if the index is upstairs, then you start adding this extra component, a Christoffel symbol, as we say, with this as a summation index, you simply add for every possible value of m, and it will give you uh, your value. If your index is downstairs, then you subtract the Christoffel symbol. The Christoffel symbol contains information regarding the curvature of your space. One way to visualize how these work is to think of a road. The road has two lanes, and if you see a car that moves from this position on the road to this position on the road, to you, it moves along two axes. It moves down and to the right. But someone who's on the road, they'll only care about if the person moves down the road, how far they are, and which lane they're in. So according to them, they only move along one axis of movement. This will be important for later. Next is the metric tensor. The metric tensor contains information about measurement and scale. An example being the flat metric. And to describe this, I'll ask a question that you probably never did. Why, in the Pythagorean theorem, are all of the components multiplied by 1? Why is it only 1x squared plus 1y squared to get this distance here? And that's because it's on flat space. If you're on a sphere, for example, then it will take this form. And this accounts for facts such as, why can, the, why can you have a 3 right angle triangle on a sphere? Of course, that, answering that question is a bit more complicated than just looking at the metric, but it's not the topic of the video. Now, Lagrangian mathematics. In uh, mechanics, you probably learned, if you've taken physics, that the energy of a system is the uh, kinetic energy plus the potential energy, which I write with the dot, meaning a time derivative. This is velocity. This is position. The Lagrangian is similar. It's the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And to use the Lagrangian to describe the, the movement of a system uh, in this form, from this you'll be able to find an acceleration from which you'll be able to drive how the system evolves. But because of the nature of this, if I were to add a constant here, then it would have no overall effect on the motion of the system as the constant would be excluded from the derivatives. You can also simply set it to negative itself, and the mathematics will all work out the same way. And this will be an important factor later on. This is also important because you can use this method to derive the motion in differential geometry. So if we take a diagonal metric of this form, you can then express the Lagrangian in this form. Use the dot as a time derivative, so time derived with respect to itself is, of course, 1. <clears throat> in differential geometry, you find the acceleration from this form, which will get you this as the second derivative. I say acceleration because it's second derivative, but it's not exactly precise terminology as it can be a second derivative with respect to other parameters than time. 
And if you look here, you can find that if you use the Lagrange method with the Lagrange and given before, you get the exact same acceleration equation. Now to the derivation from the Einstein field equation. The Einstein field equation takes this form. This is the Ricci tensor, and this is the Ricci scalar. They both describe the curvature of your manifold given by this metric. So we'll go on to derive them later on. First, to describe some of the conditions that we're using, because this is a vacuum solution, it doesn't mean that there's no mass, but that there's no mass density. We'll be looking at simply a point mass. So we can set this end of the equation to zero. Along with this, we assume that the cosmological constant is negligible, so we'll simply set it to zero. So, part one, setting up a general metric. This is the metric that we'll use to find our Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar and plug into the Einstein field equation. With it being zero as one of the conditions, we'll be able to narrow down the possible solutions and go from a general metric to a specific metric. It takes this form in general, but we like to narrow this down to just r squared. Uh, this is a coordinate choice that, in essence, claims that if you were to build a sphere around a black hole of any size and measure the material put into that sphere to find the surface area of it, then you'd then use that surface area to find the radius of that sphere, rather than calculating the surface area from the radius. And this is the method by which we'll be defining the radius of or distance from center of the black hole. d omega is simply a shorthand for angular components of the coordinate system. We'll also be multiplying the proper time and coordinate time by c squared. This will this simply goes along with the notion that in relativity we think of time moving forward at the speed of light. It's off it's often seen that people will set c to 1 as it's convenient, but I decided to include it in my derivation. Part 2, finding the Christoffel symbols. The Christoffel symbols taken from differential geometry are uh, have the condition that they must allow the derivative of the metric with respect to itself to be 0, because of course the metric only changes with respect to itself. It will have no divergence from that. So when you do that, you'll find that these are the only equations that are the only solutions that come out to not be zero. Now they are symmetric about these two indices, so you can swap them around, but those are not unique, so I've decided not to write them down. Next you'll look at the Ricci tensor, which is uh, found by using the Christoffel symbols. There are four non-zero elements of the Ricci tensor, and they are of this form. Part five is to employ the boundary conditions, our conditions being asymptotic flatness, that it approaches the Newtonian Lagrangian under column conditions, not being close to a black hole and not moving near the speed of light, being what I consider to be calm, which my friends consider to be rather irritating. But we will also say that the vac it being a vacuum solution is, again, a boundary condition as stated before. And we'll also set these elements of the Ricci tensor to zero. The reason for this being that the curvature will not change as you move purely along an angular vector. <clears throat> and this makes sense because there is no reason to favor one axis over another in terms of angles. The Ricci scalar takes this form, but we'll not be calculating it, as it uh, is not really necessary. When you plug it into here, it's easy enough to uh, calculate by i if you write it down, and you come out with this solution. Because we know it has to be zero, we know that this part itself must be zero. And if you were to integrate it, you get a plus b plus a constant equals zero. We assume asymptotic flatness to be a boundary condition, so we know that the constant is itself zero. Therefore, a equals minus b. We can then plug the solution into the theta angle uh, component of the Ricci tensor. Looking back here, we find that if the theta angle component equals zero, so does the phi angle component. As 
because they are the same except phi multiplies it by sine squared phi. And again, looking here, we find that this part cancels out uh, due to the boundary condition we've discovered here. And from that, we can simplify the theta angle component of the Ricci tensor to minus 1 plus the derivative with respect to r of r e to the minus 2b. Sorry, typo. And because of this condition, we know that this component is the uh, time component of the metric, which is e to the 2a, is 1 plus some constant over r. You usually use plus c as the integration constant, but c is already the speed of light. So lastly, we'll compare it to the Newtonian Lagrangian, and we know that under calm conditions, it must be well, the same. The, uh, the energy of a Newtonian system of gravity takes this form, this being the gravitational potential energy and this being the kinetic energy. And by simply rearranging some constants, dividing by m, multiplying by 2, and then multiplying by negative 1, you come up with this Lagrangian. I set all elements to negative to make it easier to compare to the Schwarzschild Lagrangian that we have. From here, we know that it must approach the same thing as we get far away. And here, as you get far away from the black hole, of course, this r gets smaller and you get 1 over 1 r dot, as here. But the element that doesn't vanish, this constant also vanishing, is constants have no effect on the motion of the system. But we find that doesn't vanish is k over r. As you go far away, it only gets smaller as fast as this part gets smaller. And we multiply it by c squared, so we want these two to equal each other. And that brings us to the conclusion that k equals 2gm over c squared. Negative. This gives us our final Schwarzschild metric. And we find some something interesting here, that this means that there is a light-like vector that's stationary at this position. And this is what we call the Schwarzschild radius, and this light-like vector describes the event horizon. It means that light will not move at this radius. And it's what interests us about black holes, uh, typically the fact that light will come to a stop at this area, even though light moves at the maximum speed of anything in the universe. Otherwise, it tends to Newtonian solution at low speeds and large distances. And you can see that here. <clears throat> as we tend C to, we can tend C to infinity as it is so ridiculously fast compared to anything that we experience. So if we do that, then we find this part cancels out. This part goes to zero. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. This part goes to zero makes sense is this part has no real analog to what the Newtonian equations show. Find that this part cancels out to just r times phi dot squared, or omega dot squared rather. This is an angular component, but you can show from the equations that without loss of generality, you can set the theta angle to constant at pi over 2. And this closely resembles the angular component or the uh, centripetal force part of the equation. Centrifugal force, rather, sorry. And this part goes to 1, as we said, c to infinity. And you can see that uh, the dominating forces are the centrifugal force and gravity. Now we can look at the optical metric and the way that light deflects around black holes. So. If we convert to Planck units, just for convenience, set g to 1 and set c to 1 is simply a unit choice and has a simple unit conversion, even though the conversion is of units of ridiculously small size. Uh, we can write the metric in this form. We know that light like vectors are uh, necessarily null geodesics, so we set the proper time to zero. And we rearrange the metric to just have t on one end, the 
coordinate time. And we have this equation, which is equivalent to this. And from here, we can plug it into the Lagrangian equations. And here I show why we can, without loss of generality, set theta to pi over 2 and have it be constant. You can see that that's because at pi over 2, this part goes to 0, and theta will face no acceleration, provided that it doesn't that it doesn't accelerate, or doesn't have prior angular velocity, rather. Then the phi component has a constant here. We can set this to 1 if we have a preference of theta equals pi over 2. And we see this interesting equation for our radial acceleration. Here you find that even if you have no radial velocity, you can set up an orbit around a black hole as the angular where the radial acceleration is zero at a specific radius. Right, this doesn't have any radial velocity. And setting the constant of, setting this as a constant to L, we can rewrite it this, and we can reduce our radial acceleration to a one-dimensional equation, as it only looks at the radius and the radial velocity at any given time. And you can see this, you can even see an orbit here in this simulation that I set up. The link to the simulation is in the description of this video. And here are the uh, sources I used to get the figures in my presentation. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this informative.